Uh, Christian's going to get here. He's, yeah. he's been traveling and he's yeah. finishing an issue of the bulletin. I wanted to give him to read it. I wanted to give him, I want to pass it on you had enough of this of Jamie you have. Oh, good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for uh, braving the weather and coming out. Uh, we appreciate uh, a sturdy band to come listen to the exposition of the highlights of a forthcoming book on the evolution of German foreign and security policy since unification, with a particular emphasis on the wars in the Balkans and on uh, the Iraq war and events since then. Uh, we're pleased to have our former fellow Dieter Detka back with us to present the results of what he had worked on while he was here and subsequently. Uh, many of you are familiar with Dr. Detka. He was educated in law and political science in Bonn, Berlin, and in Strasbourg. He uh, ran the office of the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in Washington for over 20 years. Well, was a very uh, prominent fixture in German-American relations and one who brought uh, really the leading lights and uh, the emerging lights of the uh, SPD to Washington and uh, introduced them to many people, myself included. Uh, since leaving the Ebert Stiftung, Dieter has been a transatlantic fellow with the German Marshall Fund, uh, a fellow at this center in 2006-07 and is uh, currently working as a visiting fellow at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies and as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Security Studies program. He's the author of several books. Uh, he's written a number of papers and monographs for the Ebert Stiftung and worked, uh, in fact, as a foreign policy specialist uh, with the Bundestag Fraktion in, in, uh, of the SPD. Uh, Dieter will speak to us about the highlights of his book, and then we will have commentary from Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff, who is currently the Senior Director for Policy Programs at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, overseeing their foreign policy and economic policy programs and its fellowship programs. Thomas uh, has been for a number of years a journalist. He was most recently before the German Marshall Fund, the Washington Bureau Chief for Die Zeit. Uh, he has spoken before the U.S. Congress, testified as an expert witness. He's been a frequent commentator on television and newspapers. Uh, he's done many op-eds in addition to his writings for Die Zeit, and he's the author of two books. And before I turn it over to Dieter Detka, I also want to welcome uh, Dieter's wife, who is a good friend and colleague, Gail Maddox, from the U.S. Naval Academy Political Science Department, and their daughter, Elizabeth, who is also with us. And uh, Dieter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, what a nice introduction. And um, I must say, I'm really grateful to you in particular, Sam, for giving me a chance to talk about my book here at the Wilson Center. And also, uh, I wanted to say it's a great pleasure to do this with Thomas Kleiner Bokov because he and I, we lived here in Washington uh, through the Iraq crisis and the Schroeder years. And uh, so we, we worked here, we lived here, and we also suffered a little bit from time to time together. And uh, that made it uh, more interesting uh, to listen to, to his comments, uh, I believe. So uh, let me first say what a great privilege it was to be here at the Wilson Center to, to do this book and, and, and do research here um, uh, and to be uh, part of a great uh, community of scholars. Uh, somewhere here, uh, David is there. Uh, and um, uh, that was wonderful. And, and what the Wilson Center has to offer here is a great public service, Sam. And, and what you're doing is um, in the best American uh, tradition, this open and, and totally uh, uh, open debate and, and true intellectual freedom. And what I wanted to say is uh, uh, this book is written in that spirit, so <laughs> and that's a warning. <laughs> um, um, I, I thought I had to uh, work on this book because, uh, as Sam said, I lived here for 20 years, and I thought I owe it to my American friends um, and uh, to the general public, too, if you want to, and frankly, to myself, too. I wanted to figure out myself 
why and how it came to such a profound clash in a relationship that was um, uh, very, very close over the years and uh, seemed uh, to have changed uh, quite fundamentally uh, at, at the time of the Iraq War. And uh, what I also wanted to figure out or tried to figure out is how uh, this is going to affect the transatlantic relationship and what this no to the war will mean for the future of uh, German-American uh, relations. Let me just mention, too, the working title that I had while I was working here was a little long, and I changed it, as you might have noticed. The working title was In Search of Normalcy, um, a German Foreign and Security Policy Between Realpolitik and the Civilian Power Paradigm. Now, that's more a program. It's not a good title, I think. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the title, uh, Germany says no, uh, the, uh, Iraq and the future uh, of German foreign and security policy is a little uh, better, not only to sell the book, hopefully, uh, but also I think it focuses more on what I really try to do, and that is to focus on the shorter years and uh, the Iraq war as the defining or a defining moment, I should say, um, in the history of German-American relations. And let me start with the first uh, issue that I want to mention here. Um, what we have witnessed, I think, uh, in, in Germany is, uh, particularly during the shorter years, is uh, not only a new generation of leadership in uh, substance and uh, in style. Uh, the 68ers um, uh, took over, and uh, they definitely facilitated the breakthrough of a new political culture uh, in Germany, uh, very different, by the way, from, uh, I think, uh, from the uh, modesty, if you want to, of the Bonn Republic and the political culture uh, that came with it. Um, and, and this new political culture, the 68ers, uh, like Schroeder and Fischer, uh, brought to the Berlin Republic is much more self-confident first, uh, but also much more urban, modern, culturally uh, diverse. And you can tell it because the formative years of these new leaders uh, was not the Berlin airlift uh, and the Cold War, uh, that too to some degree, but it was more Vietnam. It was the revolutionary atmosphere of the 60s and uh, this sense of, of uh, individual freedom and, and independence. And I think it shows in, in Schroeder's uh, foreign policy. Um, I have a little chapter in the book about Schroeder and Bush, and all I want to say here is, I mean, the world between the Schroeder administration and the Bush administration couldn't be more different. I mean, the personalities. Uh, here was Schroeder who experienced poverty in his youth and, and uh, grew up, uh, I mean, not in affluence in any way, had to fight through his whole life. and. Um, developed, of course, a, a great sense of, of independence. And, and, and Bush, who came from a very affluent background and, and never experienced anything like uh, poverty in his life and, and uh, had nothing to do, I think, and although they are the same age almost, with the 68ers uh, and that culture, the political culture that came with the 60s. So uh, in terms of political culture, uh, it was anything but uh, similar, and, and there was nothing they really shared. And I think with Schroeder's message as an economic reformer, let's not forget that this was the main emphasis. He came uh, uh, in into office, uh, an economic reformer and a modernizer. And it also came with a pronounced um, sense of national uh, consciousness. Um, and, and I say that deliberately because uh, that was also a little bit uh, suppressed in Germany over the years. But, but Schroeder you know, spoke out as an independent uh, new leader, modern Germany, democratic Germany, and um, saw a much greater legitimacy as a new um, a democratic uh, leader and as the representative of a Germany that was based on universal values and not uh, some other uh, more difficult um, sense of German national consciousness. So, and, and what I also wanted to say, that his strong sense of equality, I mean, that's really a defining character trait, um, the sense of being equal. And there is one sentence that I briefly quote here, 
in the first uh, policy declaration to the German Bundestag that he made when he said, Germany must not feel superior, uh, but also not inferior to any other nation. And, and that tells it a little bit, that he thinks, you know, we are a normal country and, you know, we are just as everybody else and, you know, I am a co-equal. And, um, and let me just add, I mean, he felt co-equal with uh, Chirac, he felt co-equal with Putin, but he never felt co-equal with Bush. There was always a difference and it comes a little bit from this different uh, background and I should have mentioned class maybe too as a background and, and it counts. I mean, you know, Schroeder from very, very modest backgrounds and Bush from anything, uh, you know, if, if there is an American elite, there it is, uh, George W. Bush and so in that respect to the, do, the two did not uh, really um, match. But let me say what really get me, got me started, and, and that is um, Ken Walls, the great American realist. And, and I have a quote here that I want to share with you because I think it's absolutely to the point. And he predicted shortly after unification, long time ago, that Germans may ultimately find that reunification and the, renewal, the renewed life of a great power are more invigorating than the struggles, complications, and compromises that come during and would come after the uniting of Western Europe. For a country to choose not to become a great power is a structural anomaly. For that reason, the choice is a difficult one to sustain. And I think he is absolutely right. He has it uh, to the point. And that's what you can see in the evolution of uh, German foreign policy, not only, I mean, Schroeder brought it really to the public, but it, it, it was there and developing over the years, and, and I don't want to go uh, into details here, but, uh, but that's the main trajectory uh, of German foreign policy, and I think uh, Ken Walls uh, got it just right. Um, this came, of course, with uh, a stronger sense that Germany will have to take on more international responsibility, and Schroeder and Fischer demonstrated that. War in Kosovo, uh, not easy uh, for the Green Party in power to do that. Um, uh, and uh, Afghanistan, even a more difficult decision, both for the Green Party and for the SPD and for Schroeder. He had to go through a vote of confidence in order to uh, push this through. Uh, but, you know, we also have to recognize, of course, that this evolution is going to be a very thorny path to a normalcy, as we have seen uh, during the Iraq War and the military commitment in Afghanistan. Um, we sense, of course, or Germans sense, of course, that, that Germany can no longer be a consumer of security uh, because there's too much at stake um, in the war on terror, uh, in Kosovo, in the Balkans, in Africa, in the Middle East, and Germany is, of course, also in demand to help contribute to uh, stability. And uh, we have to realize, of course, the Cold War is over, but conflict is not. And uh, that's why uh, Germany has to make this uh, stronger commitment, I think, to uh, not only consume security, but help to provide security. Um, and Germany has to do that because it's uh, the third or fourth largest economy in the world, it has the ambition to become a, a full member of the UN Security Council. And um, this alone, I think, tells you that Germany will have to do more in the future to um, uh, make, make it possible that the UN, NATO, and the EU are able to um, provide uh, security and uh, particularly under the conditions of a new international law, which is the responsibility to, uh, to protect, and uh, there is where we have to fulfill our uh, role. And the crux, I think, of Germany's foreign and security policy in the past was that it put too much emphasis, I think, on multilateralism, and there's nothing wrong with multilateralism, if it works. Um, uh, but too little was done to back up multilateralism uh, and diplomacy with a credible military force. Uh, now, as you can sense already, the book is written um, 
from a realist per perspective. And, and I'm convinced that uh, Germany will have to adopt a more realistic and less combat shy uh, strategic uh, culture in the future. Um, the Red Green Coalition under Schroeder and Fischer's leadership uh, led Germany to some degree out of her culture of restraint. Uh, they uh, corrected some of the weaknesses and limitations of the civilian uh, power paradigm, supporting the war, as I mentioned, in Kosovo, assuring uh, Germany's full uh, participation in the war on terror, and participated, participating in the war in Afghanistan. Now, this will increase, of course, the chances that real, realism will somehow build roots after all. Uh, but I wanted to add, of course, from my perspective, this has to be a defensive realism. Um, uh, and not um, uh, the offensive variation of realism uh, like, uh, you know, John Mearsheimer and, and others would, uh, would see it and advocate. Um, now, we have to understand why Germany committed herself to the civilian power paradigm uh, in the past, and I think these are very understandable reasons. Uh, reassurance of her neighbors, um, putting German nationalism and militarism uh, to rest, full concentration on reconstruction, rebuilding Germany after the war, uh, responsibility, give the responsibility for security to multilateral institutions, not you know, individual national uh, decision making. Uh, you remember never again and never alone became the maxims of German uh, foreign policy. And what really happened was not only that we took on these very benign uh, maxims and, and, and concepts. I think what happened too at the same time was that the use of military force was uh, delegitimized. And not only that in many ways, it was really, if we are honest, uh, Thomas, I don't know how you see it, I think we demonized the military force. And, um, and, and as a result, of course, we also weakened our military forces. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't, can't go into the details of look at the, at the Bundeswehr and, and what happened to the Bundeswehr. Half a million forces, uh, I mean, ready uh, forces, standing forces. During the Cold War when Germany was divided, now, uh, although Germany is allowed to keep 370,000, we just have 250,000. And I don't want to go into the structure of the Bundeswehr. All we have is 35,000 combat-ready troops. And, and that's a big difference from the Bundeswehr during the Cold War that was a very respected army in NATO and, and now has problems. And I'll come to some uh, details uh, in a minute. Uh, and, and I think uh, that basically, you know, the civilian power by paradigm, as I see it, is, is politically and morally not sustainable. I mean, and look at what happened in the Balkans. Um, you know, we all agree, I'm pretty sure, that earlier use of force in Bosnia could have saved life. And more importantly, I believe that um, uh, an early use of force in Bosnia uh, could have uh, spared us the shame of Srebrenica. And number two, uh, I mentioned that to some degree, we witnessed the weakening of our military capabilities and, and even when it comes to Europe and, and to look at the force structure, the battle groups of Europe, it is, uh, it is weak in terms of being able to handle a major uh, uh, crisis, uh, let's say, a uh, crisis of the type of Kosovo. That's practically impossible with what Europe has been able to build up, and part of the reason is also that uh, Germany has kept a very, very low uh, profile in uh, bringing uh, European uh, forces up to a standard that would really, uh, could really make a difference. Um, and the third issue that I have with the civilian power paradigm is that it really aids and abets non-involvement. And we have seen that in the Gulf War when Germany simply, you know, didn't move and didn't feel compelled to do something, although, I mean, it was a bra major break of international law, a, a clear breach of law where a country that's committed to multilateralism should say, wait a minute, you know, we want to hold up the international order. And, and what we did was, um, you know, 
uh, don't get involved is, is uh, the uh, position. And, and I think it diminished and to some degree undermined our uh, capacity to act as a reliable alliance partner. Now, my Afghanistan chapter has a little story, and, and Thomas knows it. I know I've seen a little article in the site that you wrote, and I'm glad you did, but it didn't get enough attention from my point of view, and that was when the Canadian forces came under attack in Afghanistan. And the Germans, you know, were in a position that, um, in theory, they could have helped. But look at the equipment of the German Bundeswehr and the forces in Afghanistan, and they had to say no, although an ally was under pressure and, and Germany should have helped, and they didn't. Lack of equipment was one issue, but also, and I want to mention that here in particular because it is the source of, of much trouble that we have uh, currently in NATO and in the alliance, and that's the Bundestag mandate for the Afghan forces in the north. It's defined in a way, narrowly geographically and politically, you know, what kind of equipment, the number of personnel and all of that, it's defined in a way that gives you practically no uh, flexibility. And so in that case, in, uh, in, in, in Canada, and uh, not only Thomas' story, but, but by now, there's a commission of the um, Canadian Parliament uh, that warned, we are going to restore our troops. And the Prime Minister, Canadian Prime Minister, followed up on that, saying if NATO doesn't move and get more troops on the ground um, uh, in Afghanistan, we're going to pull back and uh, we're going to end our commitment. And, and that's, here you reach a real dangerous uh, moment. And last point, I mean, you see how difficult it is even today to add to troop strengths. You know, we have a commitment there, some uh, 3,500 forces, but if the question is, can Germany do more, you know, there is a great hesitation to, uh, to, uh, to do that. And um, part is the, uh, well, the general weakness of the Bundeswehr, let me put it that way, and uh, that was Germany's commitment in the Balkans and other places. You know, we're really, to some degree, uh, under the present conditions, we are a, a little bit under pressure to be able physically uh, to deliver. And uh, that, in my view, uh, has, to, has to change. So what we saw is that Germany still struggles with the long-term con consequences of the uh, civilian power paradigm and a culture of, of restraint. Now, more precisely, to, uh, for the last moments here, to Schroeder's uh, no to Iraq and um, how all this um, uh, came, came together. Now, um, one of my main points in the study is, of course, that what I tried to indicate already is it was the strategic culture of the Red-Green Coalition um, and, and the new political culture that they brought in that somehow set the stage for, for this clash, for this uh, confrontation, uh, no doubt in, in, my doubt in my mind. But, but it is not really a causal relationship. I mean, there are many other factors that, that came in, and, and it is indeed a very um, complex a mixture of, of policies and politics, and um, we have to we have to recognize uh, that. But what I'm saying is, the strategic and political culture really um, created an environment that made it almost impossible to say yes. Uh, so the the no was somehow conditioned uh, was uh, there uh, to some degree uh, for the for the be uh, from the beginning. And uh, by the way, given the outcome of the war, uh, you know, the disaster that the war created in the region and, and for America's image abroad, you know, Schroeder and Fisher could even to, you know, say, you know, told you that. We're right. They have vindicated, can feel vindicated. But they also made mistakes, and I want to be open about, uh, in the Wilson Center spirit, let's be open about the mistakes that uh, Schroeder and Fischer made too. And um, I want to point out in particular uh, uh, two, two things. For one, you know, the preemptive no, and, and I'll come to that back, um, uh, the, the early opposition to the war really uh, took off the necessary pressure on Iraq to make diplomacy successful, and to be able to impose efficient, efficient sanctions. That's what you do when you say, 
no to war early on, right? Then there's no real pressure to act. That's one point. And the other is, and the other serious miscalculation, and we have to talk about this openly too, is, is to underestimate American power. And to, to believe that balancing the United States in the UN Security Council would contribute to uh, uh, secure peace, to maintain peace. That's the goal. That was the goal. Schroeder's goal and, and Fisher's goal and Chirac's goal, right? We want to maintain peace. Um, and that didn't work because, in reality, the attempt to balance the United States and underestimating the real power of the U.S. accelerated U.S. unilateralism rather than con to contain it. And that has to do with the perception of multipolarity. You know, Schroeder and Chirac and Putin seriously believe the world is multipolar in the sense we are just as strong as you are. So we have a say. So you have to listen to us, and you can do you can't do what you want. And that was the critical miscalculation. I believe the U.S. was physically in a stronger, dominant military position, and therefore felt almost threatened by the opposition and by the attempt to block and, and, and balance the United States in the Security Council. Now, um, my focus is, of course, on the German side of the story, but, but I can't somehow simply suppress uh, the point that, of course, uh, you know, American leader unnecessarily, by the way, contributed a lot to the bitterness of the whole debate. And the, the only one that I want to single out here is Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. Um, you know, when he really um, brought in or, or brought a tone to the debate that made it uh, practically impossible for Schroeder and Fischer to make amends with the U.S. government uh, without losing face. I mean, if you look back to the debate shortly before the Munich Security Conference when uh, Rumsfeld compared Germany with Libya, Cuba, and uh, maybe one other, North Korea, right? And, and, and that, in spite of something I'll discuss in a minute, you know, here's someone who puts Germany down. And, and then to believe that you can have a serious discussion and debate in the alliance is uh, somehow uh, something you cannot expect. And what I would say, uh, and that's my own wisdom, real realists don't make others lose face. That's a very uh, uh, strong ground rule of, of realistic diplomacy and policy, don't make others lose face. I think it was also a mistake to brush off Germany's resistance to war just as an act of electioneering. I mean, sure, there were elections. There were elections in the United States, too. But Schroeder's arguments were serious, too. And I know for a fact because he had good advice. Not only the whole German Foreign Office, he had also very close advisors with excellent uh, knowledge of the region, Arab speaking, and, and, and you name it. And just to brush this off as, as electioneering, I think, was a um, profound misperception and, and a misunderstanding here on the American side. Now, what, what I found, and let me summarize this with, with that remark here, uh, is that um, the uh, predominant perception here that the German-Iraq war opposition was politically and militarily um, much more, no, back up, let me back up. I, I, I started the wrong way. Um, the, the, what people didn't realize here is, was that the, the, the German opposition was politically and militarily much more limited and philosophically much more profound than many observers here understood. That's what I really want to say, and, and let me just, um, I don't have to go into the jokes here. Um, uh, you know, cheese, cheese eating, surrender monkeys and all that. You know, <coughs> look, humor is a great agent of civility, but if it comes with condescension, then it really is very, very dangerous, and that's exactly what happened. But, but let me just uh, point out, um, you know, 
how limited in the, the German opposition to the war really was. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm saying that Germany had two Iraq policies. It had one policy that would publicly oppose the war. That's what Schroeder did, that's what Fischer did. And they had another policy that would provide structural support for the U.S. military campaign. And let me give you uh, some examples here, because I think that's an, an important issue, too. Essential logistical installations continue to, th continue to, the war, to support the war effort. The war, I'm talking about the war effort now. Intelligence cooperation continued, I, I mean, unimpaired. Soldiers of the Bundeswehr took over the protection of American barracks, freeing up U.S. troops uh, to be deployed uh, for war. German soldiers operated Fox reconnaissance tanks in Kuwait, uh, you know, the, the chemical weapons detection uh, uh, tanks that only the Germans have, I believe. Uh, German ships guarded the sea lanes on behalf of CENTCOM. Um, Germany provided U.S. forces with Saddam's secret plans to, to defend Baghdad and therefore facilitated CENTCOM's U.S.-led invasion to topple Saddam. Um, I mean, that's not little bit, that's not little stuff. That's major participation. And just, you know, compare this with many uh, members of the, of the coalition of the willing, what they had to chip in. And, and what Germany as an opponent, as an official opponent did, it's quite a striking difference. Um, and also, America didn't have to pay for, <laughs> for these services. And, for many um, members of the coalition of the willing, America even had to pay to some degree. But, but in essence, what I'm trying to say is the Iraq war could not have been uh, conducted as efficiently as it did without Germany and without um, Germany's help. Last point, uh, I was surprised myself uh, how early the German opposition really started. And, and let me just make a few points here. To, to be exact, all this um, build-up of, of the opposition to war started practically in November 2001, two months after September 11. Um, and that was in the context of the vote to support the American military effort in Afghanistan. People began to warn, Afghanistan will do it. Yes, we'll push this through. Uh, I'll go through a vote of confidence, Schroeder said, but that's about it. No more. And there's a quote, famous quote from Schroeder, who said, Kosovo and Afghanistan made it possible for us to say no to Iraq. And here it is. On November 12, that was even before the Bundestag vote on Afghanistan, 2001, I'm talking about 2001, um, the Green Party went on record to say, Afghanistan, yes but no war against Iraq. And that was, of course, a response to the debate here in the United States. I mean, remember Rumsfeld, uh, um, Wolfowitz, Pearl, and others, they began to talk uh, about a war in Iraq right on September 12th, the day after September 11th. The whole debate started. I read Tenet's books, and, and there it is, with dates and all that, and but what, 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 has the same dates in that book, too, that it started early. So, you know, the German debate was a response to, you know, these early calls for Iraq, uh, Iraq has something to do with, uh, with um, September 11. Um, SPD speakers in the Bundestag on November 16 made that point, uh, Afghanistan, yes, but no uh, war in Iraq. And, and then two, two other quick uh, important issues here. You remember Schroeder's um, unrestricted solidarity. September 11 stood up, unrestricted solidarity with the United States uh, on September 11. On September 19, in the Bundestag, this famous rephrasing of the unrestricted solidarity came, saying that Germany is willing to take risks, but not willing to engage in adventures. That came on September 19, eight days after September 11. Uh, and again, I found out it was indeed a remark, you know, uh, 
in view of the voices here in Washington that said Iraq has something uh, to do with it, and so let's go after, after Iraq. And last point, Fisher made a visit to the United States on September 18 and 19, Washington DC, came to Washington, went to the Pentagon, <coughs> and came back mildly shocked because what he found out and wrote about later was that the Pentagon is determined to go after no less than 60 states. And he refers to a talk with Wolfowitz that this was uh, the, the, you know, the real task, 60 states that harbor or, or have something to do with terrorism and, and that needed to be taken on. And, and he came back practically saying, oh my God, I mean, this is a new world war. He uses the term, this, this is a new world war. And, and then he writes, of course, from the beginning, I was sure this is a very bad idea. And, and again, I mean, it shows you how early the concerns really um, uh, set in and, and began to uh, dominate uh, German thinking in, in, uh, about the war. So anyway, there were plenty of single, uh, signals uh, in Germany early on that uh, Germany would not go along with the war in Iraq unless there were clear connections between Iraq and September 11, and these were never established, as we know. Uh, so, uh, of course, the decision, the public decision, the final decision, if you want to, came much later, and let me mention that here real quickly. It came exactly on um, uh, July 31, 2002, and that's important to remember, when Schroeder and Fischer came to the conclusion that, you know, we have to take a position, of course, a public position on the war because it is going to influence, uh, you know, the elections. And then came Schroeder's famous speech in Hanover on, October, on, on, on August 5, where he made the case very, very publicly and, and emphatically and even uh, brought in a number of um, other factors, and, and the one that I mentioned here that is not unimportant is, you know, the soft German nationalism that, that seeped into his speech, you know, um, and um, uh, made the point then um, we, uh, we, we can't, we can't um, uh, participate uh, at war. The SPD is a party of peace and not a war, and, and then all this, um, you know, soft uh, pacifistic nationalism somehow seeped into German uh, politics and policies and, uh, uh, you know, dominated um, the debate uh, from, from, from then on. And it's a very deep feeling if you, uh, you know, this uh, pacifistic sense, I think, is still very strong. If you read Robert Cooper's book, which is important if you want to understand uh, EU, EU policies, uh, then, you know, Cooper is a very important source. And he speaks also of, you know, the, the three uh, types of societies, uh, pre-modern, modern, postmodern, modern, post puts Europe, of course, in the postmodern category and says, you know, this is a society uh, with an unwarlike character, unwarlike character. And, and that's essential to understand what, uh, you know, came in and what took over uh, thinking about uh, war and, and, and thinking about the use of force. And um, I, I believe that the profound philosophical uh, dif differences and that philosophical uh, collision between the U.S. And, and the German government was practically unavoidable. Uh, Sam, do you give me a minute or two for, to conclude? No. Or should yeah. I just no, break? please okay. go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> went a little long. So <laughs> um, uh, let me, let me uh, come to my conclusion here and, and just you know, make make a few make a few points for our discussion here. Um, I I don't think that Iraq the the whole crisis was a structural break in uh, German American relations. Uh, it, it sounded like it, and, and and in the public sphere there was a perception that it was, but the reality on the ground was was different. And and I would see it much more like let's say Suez. A, a major crisis of the alliance. I would uh, see it more like a major crisis, like the French withdrawal from NATO's military integration, <coughs> um, and uh, or the missile crisis. Yeah, that 
These are sure, I mean, uh, created this, um, I prefer the word collision rather than division, because if you collide, then you do that on the basis of the same values. Uh, if, if you are divided, then you, you talk about two totally different value systems and all that, and I think that's not the case. Um, so I think the uh, alliance will renew itself after this crisis too, and um, two factors that have to do with the two countries. I mean, on the one hand, Germany's new realism, I think, will somehow uh, lead to, you know, see the fundamental uh, importance of the alliance, politically and, and economically. I mean, I didn't speak much about the economic factor, but that's an essential um, uh, cohesion uh, that's there and will limit uh, the, the German uh, willingness to, you know, uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the United States at, at, at that time. Um, and the other is, of course, the sobering effect of, of the Iraq war here in the United States. I mean, that will lead to a rediscovery, a rediscovery of the importance of permanent allies as opposed to a coalition of the, of the willing. Um, German great power bilateralism that I didn't speak very much about, but it's a little bit part of the book too, uh, I think is, is more, this is not a new political orientation, this is more a dictated by economic uh, opportunities on the one hand, look at the Chinese market, India and, and all that, and well, to some degree necessities as you look at, at the energy uh, case and, and Russia and the importance of Russia. Um, and, and here a quick point about um, about Russia and and you know some I know a lot of people are worried about it and what Schroeder did after his uh, time in office was uh, you know not the perfect ethical behavior that you would expect from from a statesman but not not every politician is a statesman uh, uh, so we we have to see that too but what you see there is is a challenge for the West, and and you can see it in in the um, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Council that there is a world without the West emerging. It's it's not an an alliance, not something uh, you know of of a major threat. There are too many difficulties and conflicts inside uh, that world, but it is. A world without the West, in the sense that it, you know, will deny West the West an influence in Central Asia, in Asia, and that will be a factor that I think will help to uh, find a new uh, common strategic rationale and common strategic ground. And I think it is necessary to, if if we begin and we will, to rethink uh, Western commonality. Uh, not only to build this on on the war on terror, uh, that would not be enough. Uh, you know, the the rethinking of the West is a genuine political task, and it, it's a democracy project, and it has to be different from, let's say, a concept that would simply uh, make uh, NATO global uh, as a military alliance. So that would be my um, my conclusion and um, I also want to say and conclude with this, uh, this is a different subject of course if you think about the <coughs> renewal of the West but I think uh, in spite of Iraq it's uh, possible to do that. Thank you I talked a little bit too long. <laughs> no, so, Peter, that was very good. Sorry, thank you. Thomas? Yeah. Your comments please. Uh, well, thank you Sam. Thank you Dita. I uh, had the pleasure of uh, uh, spending a uh, a, uh, an ice storm with the galleys of this book, and it brought me through that ice prom nicely, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so you, when it's, it was warm and cozy, and the book was interesting, so it was a great time that you enabled me to have, Dita. So it, I, I found the book is, 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 in some way, it's a treasure trove because it's a tour de force uh, through 50 years of uh, German and, to some degree, European uh, foreign policy. And it does so for an American audience with a, from a German perspective. Um, that provides context and, and, and perspective in a way that probably not many books uh, that, will, that are hitting the market here do. It, sort of, it, it takes us from, uh, from the founding principles of the Republic um, through the whole Cold War um, 
uh, through uh, the, the terms of, uh, of, of German foreign policy from Ostpolitik to uh, the, the civilian power paradigm to the, uh, the culture of restraint, all of these familiar terms you will, uh, you will recognize when you read it. But there is a guiding question that the, books, uh, that the book asks, and that's the question whether or not the uh, Schroeder years represent a paradigm shift in, in, uh, in German foreign policy. And Dieter's answer is yes, it does. Um, but it's one you don't need to be afraid of. Um, the merit of the book, in my view, is that it brings into the open something that is rarely presented in such a frank language, at least not when that language is from somebody who, whose first language is the, Ger is the German language. Mostly in the German context, those things are either hidden or denied. Um, f namely, that there is a school of foreign policy thinking that it defines a new goal for German foreign policy, and Dieter has said so in the early, in his, in his first remarks, to become a European great power again. Interestingly, uh, Dieter is very soft-spoken about it. He was very soft-spoken about it here, and he's very soft-spoken about it in the book, but of course it has enormous ramifications. Um, he writes one remarkable sentence. From a realist point of view, and as you will have discovered, he considers himself one, Chancellor Schröder was quite successful at advancing Germany's new identity as a great European power. Uh, Dieter does not disagree with this project, but he doubts, as you've heard, some of, uh, sort of, the, some of the mechanics. He doubts some, some of the craftsmanship of it. Uh, he believes Schröder wanted too much at once. He overextended uh, himself. You've heard it when, uh, uh, when he was underestimating American power. Um, and he was in danger of isolating Germany. But in general uh, terms, Tita is sympathetic to the project. So this is what I want to talk about, some of which Dieter has talked about right here, some of which is in the book, and uh, you'll, uh, I'll sort of uh, present it probably for the first time for you here. Um, what is this project based on, and what is its viability? Dieter has talked about it uh, just a few minutes ago. He cleans up m with the misperception that is rooted mostly here which is that the Iraq war opposition was all about an election campaign, that there is a much deeper, and he alluded to it, a much deeper philosophical difference. And he writes, it's not an isolated phenomenon. Um, in that way, and he, he writes so, it is bound to happen again. Um, it is part of an ambition to chart a course of a more pronounced assertion of power. And he sees two other elements of the same desire at work. There's one, uh, one thing is the newfound sympathy for bilateralism rather than uh, alliance-based uh, structures. And that is especially true in the re relationship with Russia. And then there is the quest for a, uh, a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. Dieter writes, and I'll quote one of his sentences, Schröder put Germany on a course of greater national independence. Now, what does Schröder mean by independence? Does he mean uh, that he will bring Germany in a position of averted being blackmailed, let's say, by uh, a nuclear, nuclear armed Iran? Or does he mean independence from Russian gas? No. What he really means is greater independence from the United States. And Dieter quotes Schröder as voicing concerns that in the future his foreign policy of, quote, freedom and independence might be given up and German foreign policy tied again to, and I quote Schröder, or Dieter quotes Schröder, right. to the apron strings of American foreign policy. In other words, freedom and independence are code words. 
Uh, Dieter uh, quotes historian Gregor Schergen, who writes, the Iraq war opposition was precisely the moment when Germany found her true self again. The important, the word again. So in fact, uh, the Iraq war opposition was, and again, Dieter has mentioned right here, uh, was an attempt to counterbalance the United States. It was a means to get to a desired end, which is the multipolar world based on a balance of power and a great power bilateralism. So far as the analyses goes, um, I can mostly uh, sign on to this work. I find, in fact, I find it refreshingly open. In that respect, Dita might not make many new friends among those who per pursue the, this type of agenda because it's mostly a hidden agenda in, in Germany. Or in some cases, it's, it's even a, an agenda in denial. You'll, you'll hear a lot of talk in Germany that this type of agenda doesn't exist. And of course it exists, and those, especially on the left of the political spectrum, don't usually like to talk about national aspirations and about power. Um, but where I have questions, Dita, and in fact I think where we part ways, is the, is the question of, of desirability, of viability, and of political sustainability. You quote Ken Waltz. You mentioned Ken, Wal Ken Waltz. Let me also do that. He defines what a great power is, what, what a great power has to possess to be one. Population and territory, resource endowment, economic capability, political stability and competence, and military strength. Now let's walk through them for, for, for my home country. Population and territory. It has a fairly small uh, territory. It has a shrinking population, and it has a shrinking population when compared with uh, the growing world population. The percentage of the world population is dramatically shrinking. Uh, it has basically no resources. It does have economic capabilities, and it does have political stability and competence. It has, uh, and, and Dita has, has, has made that point very clear, it has very little uh, military strength. In that framework, in Ken Walsh's framework, Germany is a declining power. Um, by the way, the, the, and, and also you mentioned this in your book, Dita, the, uh, the nuclear power, uh, 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 nuclear weapons, it's the gold, oh, standard, standard, uh, the gold right. standard of this, uh, of this measurement, and there is none of that. So I speak against it. Yes, you do, of course. Um, so my question would be, why aspire a great power status when you're a declining power and don't bring the prerequisites and don't have the will to do so. Uh, now, Dita, as the realist that he is, deplores, and he's done so eloquently uh, uh, here, the military weakness of the country. Uh, you've heard the, the numbers, you've heard some examples of it, and he would like to do something about it. Trouble is, he's not quite alone. I would be on his side, but the two of us won't be enough, and there is not much aspiration to do so in the country. Um, nevertheless, he writes a bold statement. Germany has made a choice and will take on the responsibilities of a great European power out of her own will. Well, how so, if there aren't the preconditions to do so? Germany has so, uh, sought out an uh, ersatz measure to military power, and that has been the quest to become member of the UN Security Council. And Dieter points out, and I quote him again, the ambition to seek full UN Security Council membership for Germany can only be understood as an effort to acquire great power status, and I agree with him right here. The, the German argument, and some of you will have heard it uh, uh, presented over the last uh, couple of years, is that there is an, a, a post-1945 world uh, that is different from the time when the Security Council was created. Germany wasn't part of it then. 
um, and and has become a, a a viable candidate for that position. It's the third biggest contributor, and it uh, and the Security Council needs a better representation of today's world than of yesterday's world. Trouble is, uh, if if that's the yardstick by which one should measure. Uh, membership in the Security pow uh, uh, Council, rising powers, not declining powers, should become part of it. They should come from Asia and Africa, not from Europe. Europe is already overrepresented. Why one more? Um, and I'm not sure, from a German perspective, Dieter, whether it is in the German interest. Because given the lack of, uh, of will to sign on to an agenda of, uh, that, that would increase the proportion of GDP for, for, um, for defense. And given the lack of willpower to, to provide combat troops, even if you have them, you can see that debate playing out in, in the question of southern Afghanistan right now. Uh, why would you want to take on the responsibilities that come with uh, with uh, a Security Council seat because you would be uh, co-responsible for all kinds of crises across the world uh, the, the, for which the German people certainly don't want to take responsibility. Um, actually, uh, the history of the Republic has shown, it seems to me, uh, that we've done well by seeming smaller than we are. Actually, we have been, and you rightly criticized that, a net consumer of security. Michael Mandelbaum calls uh, that the U.S. is providing public goods from, uh, from, uh, from uh, the Sixth Fleet uh, to, uh, to, to open up trade routes to, to what have you. So again, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean that Germany should not take on more responsibility. I'm, I'm with you there. I'm only asking to what end and with what means. And I just don't, uh, I, I, I don't buy into the argument that a Security Council seat uh, is necessary to do that. Quite the opposite. I think the absence of a, a Security Council seat will, uh, will enable the Federal Republic to pick and choose according to its interests and its capabilities where and when it gets involved. And there are cases when it does need to get involved, and you've named them. Uh, and I don't think there would be any disagreement about these cases. Um, so in my view, the, the great power status is a paper tiger. But I have to say, it's a dangerous paper tiger. Because on the way to acquiring this, this phantasma, a political price will have to be paid. And, uh, and that's going to be my last point, because uh, then uh, we, I think we've created enough, uh, enough controversy to be able to open this up, is the relationship to Russia. The relationship to Russia in the Schroeder world is the most potent vehicle of his liberty and independence, school of German foreign policy thought. There's one word I did not find in, in, your, in your book that sort of fits into this world. It's the word equidistance. And you can find that word equidistance, I think, in the German Foreign Office or in some on the, uh, on the political left of the spectrum. And to the, 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 the equidistance that I have grown up uh, with and have come to appreciate is the equidistance that Berlin should always be in the middle between Paris and Washington. Um, because Par the French or our neighbors have had numerous wars with them. Uh, they will never be as close allies uh, of the United States as, let's say, the Brits. But for, for Germany to have the median position in, in those two has been always the most healthy position. But that's not the equidistance that is meant here. The equidistance that the proponents of the school, and I don't think uh, Dita is anywhere close to that, uh, uh, to that school, uh, um, uh, and certainly his book doesn't bear witness to that, is the, um, uh, is the equidistance uh, of Berlin between Washington and, and Moscow. Now, 
There's one interesting uh, quote in your book that Germany is or should be Russia's lawyer in Europe. And that certainly it was true and was desirable as long as, as, as Russia was on its way west. Um, that's not true anymore. And that has to have consequences, except it doesn't in the German foreign policy. It certainly doesn't in the Schröder foreign policy when you look at what he has said, and I've, uh, I'm, I'm just drawing from quotes that, uh, uh, from Schröder quotes that, uh, that Dieter has in his book. Um, uh, Schröder sees, and he said so numerous times in office and even more pronounced out of office very recently, um, that he wants the Federal Republic not to fall back into what he calls anti-Russian anti prejudices of the past. He doesn't want to see the relationship re-ideologized, re I'm sorry. Yeah. And he sees dangers of that in Poland and the United States. Um, he sees Putin as, as a person who has done, and he admires him for it, necessary corrections to the excesses of the oligarchs during the Yeltsin era. Uh, and, a, and he sees him at work doing a legitimate restoration of the authority of the state. So what, uh, and we could go on, uh, he sees the Russia develop into a pluralistic democracy. And here I have to say, uh, Dita deviates tremendously from, from, uh, from the course of, of, uh, of this school of thinking in that he, and I think rightly asks, uh, what is it that we're seeing in Russia? Are we seeing a, a deviation from a course, or are we seeing course reversal? And I think the question we, we have to ask here is, is, you make that caveat, and I think you even make it in the last sentence of your book. Your, the last sentence of your book is a caveat. Uh, Not only the last. S saying that, the, uh, that this new German foreign policy posture that you see coming out of the Schröder era and that to some degree you sign up to can only be sustainable if and when as, and as long as countries like India, China, and, and Russia remain to be uh, on their way to the West. Well, you know, let's look at it. Let's look at Russia and what does that do to the paradigm? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Thomas. That was, that was excellent and certainly did open up uh, some points for discussion. Uh, let me open it up. Dieter will give you a chance to respond to Thomas and to others in just a moment, okay. if we can. All right. Uh, we have a microphone. This is being videotaped and webcast. It will be on our website after, well, early next week after they format it. But uh, please wait until you uh, get the microphone before you speak, and please identify yourself put your question. Who would like to lead off? Not everyone at once. Ross Johnson here. Uh, Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. I was struck by something I did not hear. I did not hear Europe. I did not hear European Union. Um, is, you know, is the consequence clear enough that um, the future is the nation states and that what happens in Brussels and all that is incidental to the main um, points you've been making? Uh, yeah, I mean, good point as far as this discussion is concerned. Um, I, I, should have, I should have mentioned Europe more than I did. I, it's I it's in the manuscript. <laughs> but, but it is there. And, and of course, uh, I, I do make the point and criticize Schroeder, by the way, for being not a real good European. Uh, he learned a little bit at the very end. But, but Schroeder is known for his anti, no, no, I couldn't, uh, shouldn't go that far. But, but, you know, he had questions about the euro at the beginning. Uh, he saw Brussels as a, you know, a little bit superfluous bureaucracy. You know, why do we need this extra bureaucracy? We have enough at home to deal with, you know, and I have to go to Brussels too, my God. Um, 
No, uh, Germany uh, clearly, you know, the lifeline for German policy is is uh, Europe, and and uh, that's a very strong emphasis in the book, no doubt about it. I, you know, I take it almost as a truth that is self-evident uh, that this has to be the case. There's no other way of doing it. It's a long-term commitment, and and even if uh, you know the Germans, for economic reasons, uh, begin to forge strong, great power bilateral relationships. Russia is the main cause. And I come back in my comments to, uh, to Thomas, uh, China. I mean, that, that's a, an economic drive that, that puts Germany on a course to be, uh, you know, close to the great powers, particularly close to great economic powers. And, and that's, by the way, not only Schroeder. Schroeder went very far, wanted to lift the weapons embargo with China and all that. And the Europeans pulled him back. Um, uh, Kohl visited, was the first Western leader that visited the uh, military uh, division that implemented Tiananmen uh, Square, Tiananmen Square. Uh, and, and it was clear, you know, why the Germans do that. They do it because they want to uh, open up, of course, markets and, and economic relationships. and. Uh, they have a human rights dialogue. Europe has a human uh, rights dialogue. Uh, by, uh, by the way, it's implemented on a national level. I mean, the Germans have that, whereas on the European level, you don't have that. And I make the point in the book. I mean, Europe has bilateral relationships, too, with Russia, with China, India, and others. Uh, but the point is where the real, real dynamics are. That's on the national level, not you know necessarily on the European level. And, and uh, so Europe is, is very important, and I don't question that one minute uh, on the contrary. I would criticize Schroeder for not doing it enough. And, but let me also make this point. Um, not everything that goes wrong in Europe is Germany's fault, or German nationalism, or independence, or however you want to call it. You know, this happens um, in spite of, of German goodwill in many ways. Fischer, remember, I mean, he wanted to push for a um, federal state, practically, and, and it didn't work. And uh, so there are limits to that, and, and we have to see these limits, too. Uh, the last case is Kosovo, and you could see, I mean. But after all, it's not that bad that, you know, this, uh, dif these differences are there as long as they can be reconciled somehow and, and there remains a, a common European uh, position. But in the war in Iraq, I guess um, Schroeder should have put more emphasis on, on you know, keeping a, a European weight, if possible, uh, together uh, and, and he didn't. He didn't. Uh, up to February uh, 2003, after all this happened, <laughs> you know, there was a meeting of the European Union and they tried to patch up things after, you know, the collapse of their Iraq uh, policy. And, you know, they came out with a statement that tried to formulate a European position and it had something in it that says, yeah, I mean, in the last instance, uh, use of force in Iraq might not uh, be, or, or might be a possibility. And, and the Germans signed it. And Schroeder was asked about it, isn't that, you know, uh, against your policy on Iraq? He said, no, uh, the German policy remains the same. It doesn't change, even if on a European level, you know, you have a different nuance. That shows uh, how fragile consensus building uh, in Europe still is on the political side. And um, if at all the last uh, discussion about the reform treaty and the constitution shows that there, there is you know, a, a room for national diplomacy and the nation state that Europe just can't take over totally. And, and, and it's not going to work. We have to live, to live with these differences. And it might work uh, in spite of all these differences. We just have to see this as a messy affair and not as a clear-cut uh, European policy. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Bob Icord. I work for uh, USAID. Um, I'm interested in your views about, and I don't know if you deal with this in your book, but I think it's relevant in terms of some of the themes that were talked about. 
uh, about the evolution of German policy, policy toward energy security um, and its relationship to the questions related to independence and whether Germany is undercutting an effort to develop a common European energy policy and whether in a sense there is a growing confrontation or a collision as you say with the US on, on these issues which have been as you know at the center of G8 consideration over the last several years. If I can elaborate just a little bit, um, I mean clearly we've talked about the growing dependence on Russian gas uh, which is true for Europe as a whole of course and is to some extent weakening the overall independence of Europe or at least threatening it. Uh, two, it's clear that Germany has taken a position that in a sense plays into Gazprom and Putin's strategy to bypass Poland and Ukraine with the uh, North Stream and South, now South Stream pipelines. Um, clearly there has been a major um, deal making between the mega energy companies, Eon, Ruhrgas, RWE, and the Russian interest, which raises questions about what is their influence in the political scene in Germany and in both broader security and foreign policy. Um, and clearly, and I've, I've seen this in my dealings with Germany over the many years on the nuclear issue, obviously there has been a major change in terms of policy toward nuclear power, which Germany was, you know, has major capabilities in, in and that has been uh, very evident in the environmental positions of the government and the efforts to, yes, to develop policies toward uh, cleaner energy sources, renewables efficiency that contribute to climate change and the strong position the government's had on that uh, issue. Um, so any, anyway, I th uh, sorry to, for being so long, but I wanted to sort of lay out some of my views with regards to some of the factors that, and to see how you see the evolution of German views on, uh, with regards to this sort of broad spectrum and its relationship to security policy. Uh, very good question. Uh, we, we should have uh, talked more about it, of course, because it's so essential, and, and it is to, um, Europe as, as it stands now and with the lack of a common European um, policy on energy, that's the crux of the matter. And that's why you have countries like Germany and Italy and, and France is a different category because it covers 70% of its energy needs with nuclear energy, right? So they're in a different boat. Uh, we are not. Um, uh, and we will be dependent on Russian gas and oil too to a large extent. I think it's uh, probably one-fourth of, of, of the oil that comes from Russia. And we uh, should not only talk, talk about gas. Gas is even more dramatic uh, because there the dependency is 60-70% um, is going to remain high for the next uh, experts say 10, 15, 20 years because the alternatives are not available. Um, the alternatives being Nabucco, uh, the alternatives uh, being uh, uh, liquefied natural gas uh, from uh, Qatar, from the Middle East, uh, uh, from other countries, um, which uh, Schroeder would argue, well, look, uh, Russia is a reliable energy supplier, uh, has been all the time, over the years. And should we become more dependent on the Middle East, uh, you know, this instable region? Uh, is that a good solution? And um, one thing is clear that Germany wants to diversify, uh, but the time factor is a critical issue, and, and I deal with it quite a bit in my Russia chapter. I will come to it because uh, uh, maybe I made a mistake, and, and analysis is taken as my opinion here. I mean, well, have to be careful. Uh, but um, I criticize, uh, A, the, the lack of a European uh, energy policy that has to come. I mean, it would already help a little bit. And Germany, by the way, is willing to do that. Um, uh, incidentally, I should mention, you mentioned the, the um, northern pipeline and, and um, you know, you said bypassing Poland, w which is one factor. But on the other hand, 
let's not overdo the case. I mean, when Radek Sikorsky says this is the equivalent of the Hitler-Stalin pact, you know, he goes overboard. And, you know, we, we are not in the 30s anymore. Poland is a member of the European Union, and so is Germany. And, and, and there is a, um, by the way, even in the uh, Portugal uh, uh, um, constitution uh, text, um, you know, there is a common defense and, and assistance clause, and, and that will take over, and that will play into the energy business, because uh, as Germany develops alternatives, and liquefied natural gas uh, is one, uh, Wilhelmshaven is, is the, <coughs> the um, uh, place where this is going to end up, and uh, you can bring it in by ship, and that's more flexible and gives Germany a possibility, you know, to help Poland if, if they would be under pressure. I mean, the Polish concern is, of course, you know, the Germans get gas from Russia and, and uh, away from, from Poland, and um, Poland will be under pressure from Russia. It's not that easy. I mean, there is uh, perhaps a presumption uh, possible of, of a greater sense of commonality than uh, Radek Sikorsky would admit. But, but you point to difficulties that are difficult to overcome. They are on the way, and, and, and German uh, foreign policy is interested in more diversification, but let Nabucco be developed. And, uh, and Nord Stream, by the way, the EU has recognized that Nord Stream is not that bad a thing to have, <laughs> even if it's uh, a direct connection between Russia and, and Germany. Uh, the important thing is to, you know, to have a, a, a gas supply, and, and Schroeder sure, did it for understandable reasons, and, and there might uh, not only be uh, the reason that this is good for Europe, it's good for Germany first. And you know, his involvement in Gazprom, I think that was, um, it smacks, it stings, it's, it's uh, from my point of view, it's unethical, it shouldn't do that. But again, I mean, not every politician is a statesman, and, and, and that's true for him too. Um, again, uh, I agree with your point, uh, Europe is, is on, a, on a better way, but um, don't lose your breath uh, uh, about thinking, you know, a European energy policy is going to come soon, and a energy independence is going to come soon, even if we deploy all the alternative energies that we are capable of. It will take a while. And, and Germany put itself up for trouble because of the phase out, nuclear phase out, you mentioned it, uh, and, and, and still says we have to and will reduce 40% of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, baseline 1990, um, uh, that's hard if you don't have nuclear energy. It puts Germany in, in, a, in a hot seat to accomplish it because if you don't have nuclear energy, which is you know, reducing the amount of CO2 emissions, then the pressure is all on efficiency, conservation, biofuels, uh, solar energy, wind energy, where the Germans try to invest. But look at it, all of this is not enough. And that's the problem, and uh, I, I just can't uh, deplore more than I just did. Can I just make one or two quick points? One is this country knows something about oil interests being represented in politics. The same is true for gas interests being represented in the German government. The, in, the interests of, of four large utility companies or, or supply supply uh, giants are have been enormous on policy uh, there has been no they have not been disconnected secondly um, the educational result of the Russian tur Russians turning off gas to Ukraine has been enormous. It has basically led to a reversal of insight that not privileged supply, not privileged supply chains, is is desirable, but interdependence and consumer power, in the European context, is desirable. And thirdly, 
uh, Chancellor Merkel has basically reversed uh, Schröder's policy. Little noted, she has offered uh, for Poland to have a connection to the uh, to the pipeline if it so desires. So whatever you hear as as chatter about about this, it should be a, a, a yester song. It, it it it's easy to solve and it should be solved. And I think it was a, is a political miscalculation mm -hmm. by Schröder. We have time for one more question, Tom Wolfson. Uh, Dieter and, and Thomas, you both raised a, a number of interesting points, which is worth a, a far longer discussion than we have time for here. But the point I wanted to bring up was a little worry about um, uh, being in, in sync or out of sync with each other, that is, the two countries and their policies. Um, what I saw Schroeder striving against and writing off as dependence and narrowing his freedom of movement were in the institutions of German foreign policy that had all been created for very profound reasons and avoiding isolation, being embedded in Europe, being connected with the United States. At various times in fairly ham-handed fashion, I think, he tried to box against the limits of all three of those and uh, nearly faced a couple of disasters of his own. There was a period there in the winter of 2002-2003, if I'm not mistaken, um, before the French decided which side they were on, when Schroeder's anything but without us meant that had the French flop, uh, flipped the other way, he would have been isolated. And I know Fisher and the Foreign Office people were terrified for that brief period before uh, De Villepin's statement in the Security Council took away that fear. Um, now, of course, our great tragedy on this side is that in those years our administration was not very capable and certainly not dispo well disposed to try to figure out these zigs and zags of what Schroeder was doing and what should be resisted, what should be encouraged, what should be treated softly, what needed to be uh, given a hard message between, between the eyes. Um, it seems to me that for a number of, of reasons we're now going to head into a period, whoever's president next, uh, when we will be disposed to have a, a, a gentler, more sophisticated, subtler touch in foreign policy. Um, Germany's presumably now going to be heading into a period when forming a domestic political consensus on anything is going to be tougher uh, with the, the uh, party's landscape and so forth. Uh, this means that any kind of, of German correctives to Schroeder's course, and that's the, those are the terms in which I'd want to see it, uh, will be harder to manage and harder for outsiders to understand. Well, that's a real difficult one uh, to, uh, to relate um, the, the whole complex of issues to German domestic politics. And, and you, I know Tom follows uh, Hesse and, uh, and Hamburg uh, next week. So <clears throat> and, and you're right. I mean, the, the domestic landscape is to some degree scary uh, because uh, the two big parties have more and more difficulties to form a coalition with just one partner. And, and then, you know, you begin to play with do you bring Die Linke in or not if that happens and if that produces majorities. Don't forget the theoretical majority in the Bundestag today is a majority on the left. If Die Linke and the SPD and the Greens would get together, they could elect the chancellor. So Germany has a left majority. And Hesse, to some degree, confirmed it, and we have to expect that the same is going to happen in Hamburg. So you, you have an excellent point uh, that the domestic foundation uh, could be under threat, too. You know, the only point that I can make in, in, in this respect is uh, if there would be exper experiments with the left, the Linke now, La Fontaine's party in Germany, um, it can't govern uh, because we have a federal system, there's the Bundestag, there's the Bundesrat. Even if you have a Bundestag majority, you know, it's hard to uh, find a majority to bring in the, the second chamber, the Bundesrat. And I would see great difficulties for a majority of the left to produce that. Uh, so 
so far the SPD is firm and you know no coalition with the left on the federal level definitely and we'll see the speculation right now that Hesse might open up ways to you know bring the left in for the first time on the uh, state level uh, I, yeah that's a, that's a real that would undermine I think the if if we are speculating now about the left and I guess that was your fear it's my fear too oh, well, that's only part of it uh, sorry that's only part of it yeah, yeah, that's that's all part of it. Uh, so yeah, that's that might that might be true. I have to uh, I have to admit, uh, but but then there is there are realities, there are economic realities that even the left can't deny and 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 would have to uh, change. And and we have seen it with the Greens when they came to power. They were an anti-NATO party, and uh, then you know once you are in power, you, you do adopt a different position. So I don't want to speak for the left here. Be, be careful. I, I don't want to do that. But but I can only confirm you have a good point in saying the domestic situation is possibly even undermining what I'm trying to say here. But let me take uh, a few uh, uh, minutes or, no, or a minute or two to to um, to take up a few points that Thomas made, and I'm grateful to him that he did. Uh, the first one is. Um, one has to be careful, uh, you know, not to shoot the messenger. And and uh, for me to uh, for me to report about what, what's happening in between Germany and Russia and energy sector and all that, uh, and and reporting about it and and and, and describing it as it is, uh, is not necessarily agreeing with it. And I think I have enough critical remarks about Nord Stream and what Schroeder. Uh, is driven by, namely, the fear that Russia uh, could turn around and, and seek a strategic partnership with China and India and, and then I leave I Europe in the cold. Did I, huh? did I not make that clear on no. Russia? I didn't. No. Okay. Uh, no, not enough. Not okay. enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so I, I want to make that point first. And your real concern, and again, I, I, I do agree with you, um, is, is, is two points about you know, this new policy that I tried to talk about, the legitimacy of it and the capability to live up to it. Real good points. Now, the first point, the, the first on, on legitimacy, that's something I'm really worried about because uh, you know, my thinking is that if a country like Germany becomes a member of the UN Security Council, it would be good for the system for the following reason. I think it is important that a non-nuclear power, and I include Japan too, by the way, a non-nuclear power becomes a member of the UN Security Council in order to make the NPT regime acceptable. If you keep the P5 as a group of nuclear powers, as it is now, What's going to happen down the line is going to delegitimize the whole NPT regime. Then, indeed, what I'm saying is true. Gold standard is nuclear power. If you want to be someone, you have to acquire nuclear weapons. And that's what we absolutely should not do. So German and, and Japanese membership would emphasize and underline and legitimize the NPT system. That's what I'm worried about. And, and I say, you know, don't tinker with uh, John Mearsheimer and Germany down the line under pressure from Russia, you know, acquiring nuclear weapons. I mean, that's the catastrophe that would, you know, destroy Europe. Let's not do that. So, you know, my, my thinking is that, you know, the, the German legitimacy to, to do that is for the NPT regime. Uh, and, and look back, the UN system was originally um, you know, just one nuclear power, the U.S., just getting it, getting it in 1945, right? And the others came later to that quality of, of being nuclear powers. And, and again, what I'm trying to say is do not try to run the world just with nuclear powers. If you do that, then Pakistan would have a claim to become a nuclear power. Uh, Israel would have a claim and, and other you know, nuclear powers too. And then you create a real disaster, a scenario for disaster. Don't do it. Uh, you know, let Germany and, and, and Japan become 
members and and you will have a better you know uh, sense of of running the world also with non nuclear powers uh, that's that's the key of my own thinking and and that's how i would um, defend it and 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 make it possible you know to keep japan non nuclear and germany non nuclear and put more pressure on iran and and others to uh, you know give up their nuclear aspirations that's the, that's my thinking and i just wanted to clarify that now to uh, Germany, the declining power, and, um, and, and not being even able to do it. And, and I think that's a myth. Um, a country like Germany, um, even if its population is declining to some degree, um, we used to be 82 million, I guess, in a couple of years, uh, we'll be 74, and, and well, that's right. But Economically speaking, it doesn't have to be a catastrophe. You know, that was the old argument in the 20s for Mussolini and Hitler to say, here, we have to produce children and, and we are declining. And um, there is economic growth possible for population decline. And population decline is not the only measure. Uh, what, what really counts is innovation and industrial, your industrial base. And you might see that under threat, uh, you know, Germany phasing out nuclear power. That's a question whether that was wise and did not take off a capability for Germany, an industrial capability uh, that was quite important. But again, I would say, no, we can make up for it, uh, you know, by uh, renewable energies. And, 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 and the Germans have done a lot in, in that respect. They're, uh, leading among the solar powers and, and photovoltaics too, and uh, um, you know there there is growth potential in in this civilian area, right? I I wouldn't see that as as an absolute economic uh, uh, road to to decline. Uh, we will all go through different phases in our economic development, uh, but it doesn't say that uh, Germany uh, will uh, just fa has to face uh, decline. Um, and 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 still, I mean, uh, look at our growth rates. It's not that ba bad. Um, once, and and we are at that point now where unification and the downside of unification is overcome. You know, where we had to chip in some a a Marshall Plan every year for 20 years since 1990, a Marshall Plan. Uh, 12 billion dollars at the time. Uh, today's value is some 150 uh, billion. That's what we did to East Germany, West Germany. And you can't tell me that an economy that's capable of doing that is in decline. And 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 that's that's not the case. Number two, what, and and we we are now being in a position where we have overcome that real uh, drag on on German growth and and economic capacity. Number two. European enlargement, very important for the German economy because that's our you know, economic space and, and we know how important it is. You have to invest first. You know, if you look at the number, you could say Europe is now much weaker as it becomes uh, enlarged and, and, and bigger. Yes, because at the, uh, number, the numbers of, of the gross GDP of all these countries and then you find out, gee, the Europe of the six was much richer than the Europe of the 27. Very true. But uh, once you overcome these differences and, and you see already, you know, there are emerging economic powers in, in the East. Look at Poland and Hungary. And, and you know, they made their way and, and added now to, to European growth rates. And once that is overcome, and again, you talk about a long time, German unification took us what is it now? Almost 20 years? Did we ever anticipate that? The European integration, I, I'm not saying unification, but the European integration is not going to last that long and is not going to be as costly as the German unification. Anyone who wants to do integration the German way should be uh, considered to be crazy because it was insane to do it the German way and, and simply picking up healthcare, unemployment, all the bills that run up in a weaker economic part, pay for it, um, 
that we can't do. But but uh, you know, with with the economic strategies that that are now uh, predominant for for Eastern European uh, enlargement, I think you know the whole area is a growth area. And and then I wouldn't be as worried about the German economy because uh, you know the German economy as it is structured will still have uh, huge markets and and it's not going to be uh, only you know towards the downside. So um, I would be more optimistic in terms of of our capability to do that. Now, last point. Um, you seem to be concerned that even on the military side uh, there's danger uh, to do that. And, and I disagree because look at the nature of the problems. I'm not talking about a new nationalistic uh, Germany. I'm talking about a Europe and a NATO and a UN that is capable to deliver on the issue of human security. That's what you're talking about. That's what everybody tells you. The greatest danger in the future is nationalistic ethnic conflict in Africa. Look around. I mean, we sit here and, and talk about, you talk about danger. Sorry, I don't mean you personally, Thomas. Five million people die in Congo, and, and we sit here and, and, and say it is dangerous to send in troops to stop bloodshed, and, and I disagree. I think... We are doing a terrible job in, in providing a measure of human security, even if we can. And, and for Germany to sit on the sidelines in the Balkan Wars and, and not do anything, I think, is a serious, for me, this is politically and morally unacceptable. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a Germany that will fulfill its commitments as an alliance partner that would say, uh, well, if we need, if we have a common task in Afghanistan, we better make sure and contribute and make it successful. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I want to see the Bundeswehr being capable of. And, and to reduce it, I don't want a, a, an army that's even as big as, as it was when Germany was uh, divided, this half million. I don't want that. But you can't tell me that it is good for Germany to disinvest in, in, in our armed forces and then be a, an, you know, not a good ally. You know, do what we did to Canada and, and Afghanistan and, uh, you know, have difficulties to, you know, get a police force there, have difficulties to get a police force to Kosovo. That's what I'm talking about. And if you don't do it, you're going to run in the next humanitarian catastrophe. And, and human security is the issue, and, and I think Germany hasn't done enough, and that would be my lesson from World War II. I'm not talking about an army that runs over Europe and, 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 and does, you know, no, that's not the issue. The issue is that we do not do enough uh, in, in terms of, of human security, and I want to contribute to that, and, and I want to, uh, fill our role in NATO and the EU, and I want to make that stronger, and be able uh, to, you know, to prevent what what I see is happening almost on a daily basis. The next spot is Kenya, uh, and and who takes care of of these issues? Uh, it, it's not going to be done from those who you know are really poor and can't help. Uh, we have room to grow for the Bundeswehr and, and, and have more forces that would be capable to act in that situation. And we haven't. We have trouble to keep these 10, 000, less than 10,000 soldiers abroad in the Balkans in Afghanistan and complain when we need uh, 1,000 more. The reality is we need much more than that. And, and Germany has to share that burden. Thank you. Sorry. Thomas, a final word? Uh, I think Dieter should have a final. The only thing, uh, only thing I want to say is a personal note. I was a correspondent in this town for five or six years during this Iraq crisis. The worst thing that happened to me was reporting about this town being being shot as being the messenger. So I owe you, <laughs> I owe you an apology should I have done that because it's inexcusable and I, I, I owe you at least one beer. Oh, well, well no, I can take that. I can not worry about it. <laughs>
Well, please join me in thanking each of our speakers for very interesting presentations and food